So wonderful to see a full room so early in the morning. I hope you enjoyed the evening last night and you're ready for a very exciting uh, panel uh, to start the day. I would like to invite my panelists uh, to come up to the stage and so I can then introduce them. So the relationship between news media, social media, and news aggregators, it's complicated. Um, one of the recurring patterns in history has been that technological innovations have caused fear. We heard it yesterday also from the mayor of Hamburg said when radio was introduced, people were concerned about a tool that could spread ideas and opinions so fast and so <coughs> Sorry, uh, to such broad audiences. And when television was introduced again, um, people were concerned that it would be brainwashing their audiences. Uh, today we are looking at another technology, um, different um, type, type of um, tool to disseminate ideas and opinion. Um, in particular, in this panel, we're looking at um, not only the internet in general, but in particular social media and news aggregators. Um, social media have been in many countries and still are today one of the very few spaces for free expression, the few spaces where dissident opinion could be expressed. Uh, they have been, uh, many have said, have been a, a fundamental tool in the Arab Spring. And, um, and similarly, Google has certainly played an important role in standing up to some dictators, uh, um, refusing censorship imposed by countries such as China. So, and yet, um, in particular following the Trump campaign, social media, news aggregators have come under great um, criticism. We, I have four wonderful panelists uh, for today, and if you allow me to introduce them. Um, on my right, um, Espen, sorry, Espen Egil Hansen, um, who uh, editor-in-chief of Aftenposten, which I understand is the biggest newspaper in uh, Norway, uh, largest circulation newspaper in Norway, and um, he became famous among others uh, for a letter Espen wrote to Mark Zuckerberg uh, of Facebook in September last year, expressing concerns over Facebook removal of the well-known Napalm Girl photography. Um, Facebook also came under criticism for failing to respond, for failing to have a voice. And that's why I'm so glad that Facebook has finally found a voice. And uh, Patrick, <laughs> um, sorry, Patrick Walker is with us today. Um, I understand is the fourth panel where Patrick and Esben are sitting together. So um, I'm sure they're well trained for this conversation and uh, <laughs> thank you so much for being here. Uh, Götz um, Hamann, um, editor at Die Zeit and who has led the digital transformation uh, at the paper's editorial departments. Uh, this site online platform has been extremely successful. It's probably one of the most successful um, online platform of a well-respected uh, news media in Germany. So thank you for being with us, um, Götz. Jared Rubinstein, uh, representative of Google for the, um, Germany, Austria, and Switzerland region. Um, on my left, and thank you for being with us, um, Jared, and also thank you for um, supporting this Congress. Um, let me try to just set, um, set the stage. Social media news aggregators take advantage of the content produced by news media. Feel free to, 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 to argue against me. Uh, take advantage of the content produced by news media to attract audiences and advertisers. Uh, they are very successful in doing so and audiences are shifting toward consuming news through social media platforms and aggregators. 
on the other hand, news media um, take advantage of social media news aggregators to disseminate their content and reach larger audiences. And this has caused a number of changes, uh, which some may even call problems, uh, but certainly a shift in the advertising market, confusion among audiences about the sources of information, um, possibly a change of criteria to prioritize the dissemination of certain information, um, questions about um, the need for social aggregators uh, and uh, and social media sources and news aggregators to have editorial criteria. Um, so I look forward to having this conversation with all of you. The first question to the panel for me is, what are the changes generated by the very close interaction and interdependence between news media organization and social media? Um, and who are the winners and who are the losers in this? Espen, if you would like to start. Yeah, I'll start with the easy question. <laughs> well, first, um, I think when we discuss the relationship between social media and the media, we often do it in the framework of business, us as a business. For me, at least today, that's not the real uh, discussion. Uh, it's about uh, democracy. Uh, social media has, and internet has changed uh, changed de democracy uh, and we are in the midst of recreating uh, democracy. I think that's the real important uh, framework. Uh, I look upon journalism not as content but as necessary institutions to make democracy work. Uh, the mechanism is you have more than one journalist in a, in, in a group, there's an editor-in-chief that is, you can make responsible, uh, committed on a transparent, ethical platform, and so on. That, those, that mechanism makes an institution that is necessary in a democracy, and that those institutions are being weakened. And then we can discuss uh, why. Uh, social media uh, and internet has been good for democracy. More people can speak out, more people are able to uh, particip participate, but on the other side, we also have seen the, the, the growth of a few players in this market, Facebook being uh, the largest one, and with that uh, size uh, comes respo responsibility. Mm -hmm. Sorry, may I turn? May I, may I turn to you? What What are the main changes you see, and uh, who is winning out of this, yeah. and who is losing? Um, so I'm I'm working for a glass half full com company. Uh, I think the technological change from print to digital to mobile has brought with it an enormous information wealth from journalism, from other sources. Everyone can speak their voice today via social channels, via blogs, etc. Um, I think we are still in the middle of a, a transition phase of a first chapter where this whole ecosystem of uh, actors that produce content, that distribute it, that host it, uh, still find their way. We sit in this whole game in the place where it's about information discovery, um, which is an important part that we play because there is so much information. Um, we try to bring information to the user for to answer the question the user has, be it a news-related question, a political-related question, or be it an inv investigative piece uh, that a journalist is producing somewhere in the world. We try to put tools in place so that the user or that journalist can do the job. Um, I think it's, the picture is very complex and changing. Um, so it's, I think we should go beyond the terms of winners and losers. I think um, we need definitely all our, all, all that we are part in this news ecosystem to work together, 
to find sustainable models, how we best make that world for, work for everyone. I to take the next question ahead. I totally see the challenges to the existing publishing business models, uh, but I'm, for example, here to definitely play a role in there. Thank you for that. Kurtz, if I may turn to you, do you feel that Jared mentioned that we are here to offer the users the information they look for? Uh, is that role being fulfilled and how that does interact with you, your experience at producing an online news platform? Well, first of all, the upside of uh, um, Google and Facebook is ex existing is that we really reach new audiences, younger audi audiences. Um, uh, the reality is that um, Google and Facebook are, are not neutral and uh, it's only good for us as long as they act as good hegemons. And uh, we're here to discuss whether they do so. I, mm, at the moment, I see um, our publishing house is, is, in, a, uh, is in a quite um, easy position because it's growing and we have the time to uh, use and uh, the, the, the audience we get through Google and Facebook and the attention and the money to, um, to gain digital subscribers. Uh, the downside is that, um, uh, for example, Facebook has changed its algo, uh, or it's changing its algo continuously. And it's not really um, just giving many hints in which way they do it. For example, two months ago, um, something has changed and many publishers saw a dramatic drop in referral traffic. And we don't know yet um, uh, where it comes from and uh, what it was good for. So it's somehow, um, some of it is trial and error and uh, it's, um, not what I would call a really equal partnership. So that are some of the challenges I see at the moment. Thank you for that. Patrick, if I might turn to you, algorithms, uh, yes. the, the, the big um, secret uh, or uh, the big question for everybody, Facebook algorithms. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us something about it? Uh, is there, is there what, what are the, the criteria used by Facebook to define the algorithms? Sure. Um, it's a really good question, and, and the algorithm is often brought up, and I think it's important for people to understand you know, the, the purpose of it as well. Um, the word algorithm actually means a set of rules meant to solve a problem. And what we're trying to solve for on Facebook is if you have lots of friends, and if you follow lots of pages, uh, and if we just let everything uh, posted by those you follow come in chronological order, you would have a constant flow of probably thousands of posts per day with no rhyme or reason and, and no ordering that would be suitable for you, uh, particularly in a time-limited uh, environment. So there's a real purpose. The problem we're solving is, let's say you have 100, 200 friends, you would have 2,000 posts in your feed. If you follow just The Guardian, you'd probably have uh, 100 or 50 different stories, and that would probably be intrusive, and you might unlike that, right? So there's a real purpose to, to ordering it. Um, so the algorithm fo follows what we call our newsfeed values, and we, we publish these. Uh, we try and get as granular as we can, uh, but we also have a, uh, a, a relationship with, with spammers and others that are trying to take advantage of it, so we need to make sure that we do keep it fresh. Um, so we focus on friends and family first. So if you're following your friends and your family, this is the original purpose and, and the way in which you're connecting on Facebook, and we're respecting that. Uh, we also focus on uh, things that are informative and entertaining, and we have lots of ways we can uh, adjust for what we see as informative. For example, has this article been read through completely? Has it been shared? Has it been liked? If it's been read through completely and hasn't been shared, that also is an important message. Maybe it's something sad, and maybe it's still valuable. So we want to make sure that we're taking into account these things. And it does shift and change over time, but we are and have been a lot, focusing a lot more on quality uh, b based on these sort of signals that we get. Uh, and then, you know, there are, other, there are other ones that we publish, and we try and make sure we, we, we inform our partners when we do make changes. Um, but it is part of working in a very dynamic, fast-moving technology environment as we have to keep um, adapting to, in many ways, uh, surveys that we do every single day with tens of thousands of people asking them whether this uh, was useful to you. 
and then adjusting. Now, at the same time, uh, this isn't moving towards, uh, as some people have claimed, the lowest common denominator of uh, what uh, most people like, right? So we're focused a lot on, as I said, the quality. Uh, we're focused, uh, particularly over the last six months, I would say, on supporting um, quality uh, journalism as well as this is, as you said, the foundation of, of democracy. Uh, and, and removing uh, the worst offending uh, aspects that, that have been identified, which would be financially motivated spam, and try and finding, trying to find ways through third-party relationships to also call out uh, stories that might be uh, disinformation or even straight out false. Um, so lots of things we're doing, and uh, I think the important thing to note is you know, we're entrusted by now over 1.9 billion people with their time. Uh, they're coming to Facebook because they find value. Uh, we are working with thousands of news and media organizations um, uh, because they also find value, and we take that place as intersection extremely seriously. Uh, we don't always get it right, but I think the investment we've made in, in teams and in markets, in the Facebook Journalism Project and the News Integrity Initiative, I can speak about each of these later, um, I think we, we hope demonstrates uh, a real commitment to solving these problems because you're right, it's imperfect. Um, but it's worth solving together. Um, may, may, I, may I follow up on this? Um, uh, there was another change announced, I think, a couple of days ago. And I, I think um, it, it, it come, it, it's trying to sort out fake news and, 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 and so on. Can you um, share with us some data about um, uh, what impact it has on, for example, uh, analysis compared to commentary or broadsheet compared to tabloid content? Yeah, I can't share data specifically on that, on that question. And what happens is when we make adjustments, we made one not too long ago to focus on uh, longer uh, consumption of video. So it wasn't about views, it was about uh, watch time. Uh, and for some that were uh, having high levels of viewership but not a lot of watch time, there was a decline. For some that had higher quality longer videos, there was an increase. And so wh what some partners on one change might see as a net gain, others might see as a net loss, depending on where they fit within that spectrum. So it's very hard to give specific examples on particularly for a particular partner. Um, but we have seen people adjusting as well to those changes, because one thing our team does, people like Guido in the audience here in Germany, is we go and we work with our partners to say, these are the changes, these are the things you need to be mindful of. Because to be honest with you, a lot of organizations, even very well-meaning um, media organizations do tend to, for commercial reasons, go towards the signals that are giving them the best financial return, which aren't necessarily for us a quality threshold that we're aiming for as well. Does that make sense? If I may turn to Esben. Um, Patrick mentioned quality a number of times. Quality is being one of the core criteria in the, in the definition of the algorithms. Um, and, I would, and I would add also for uh, Google News search, I think also using algorithms to define a certain uh, what appears on the first page. Um, is that serving the public interest? Is quality really what is coming out? Quality in terms of what, from a newspaper perspective and a public interest perspective, we expect our audiences, or should it even? I mean, Well, <clears throat> algorithms are not a bad thing. It's a good thing because it makes us, uh, they edit. They do what we do, they edit. Uh, they uh, decide what content you will see in your news stream. We should learn from Facebook. We should build uh, more and better algorithms that are built on the principles of publishing. This is important. Just because you have been away for three days, we still think you should read this uh, article and, uh, and so on. So, however, algorithms are not a neutral thing as many seems to uh, think so. Behind each of the multitude of algorithms deciding what ends up in your feed in Facebook, there are real people that have done real choices how to do it. And there, uh, there is a wish, there is a goal for each of the, of the uh, algorithms. And I think uh, Facebook and probably also Google should be more transparent. I understand the business side. You, you don't want to, to give away uh, what you do to your main competitor, which is not us, it's Google. <laughs> 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 yeah, 
Right. Also, also, uh, what Patrick is saying here is uh, last time I checked our social network. Um. <laughs> Quiet now. <laughs> Sorry. Um, you don't want be, to be too transparent because uh, then the spam spammers and uh, hackers also can use them uh, to their uh, advantage. However, you should be much more transparent uh, to uh, to research. You should open up to research uh, to see the effect on filter bubbles, for example, which is in my head it's obvious that the result of the kind of algorithms that you prioritize in Facebook just has to lead to filter, uh, filter bubbles. So again, uh, this is about the responsibility where, when you have 1.9 billion daily users, you are today the main uh, medium uh, in, the, in the world and there's one person on top controlling the algorithms, Mark Zuckerberg, that responsible, with that res goes responsibility and I think you should be a lot more transparent. I'll turn to Patrick in a moment. I just wanted to turn to Jarrett and basically um, Google News search, even there, uh, we, we all know users, uh, most of them stay on the first page. Whatever results come on the first page are those that count. Um, and, and this has also come under um, attack, if you want, in terms of Google ability to define what appears on the first page. Um, what are the criteria used by Google to define their algorithms and uh, are there efforts to improve them in terms of, with, with the public interest in mind or do you, is public interest not the criteria? And uh, public interest in the, in, the, in the sense that the news industry uses it, not only whatever our audiences are interested in. So I'm, I'm not the algorithm expert. I'm the expert for the work that, that Google does together with journalism and publishing. Um, we get three billion search questions every day. Three billion every day. 15% of those we have never seen before. It's a big number. And the, in contrast to, to social media, the task of the Google algorithms, there are many, um, is to give in that moment, on that place, to that user, the answer. With all the search history, location history that that user has within his Google account. So, um, the task there is relatively simple. Does the answer, does the answer, answer the question? If not, we see it, we know that was a bad job. If that user never comes back afterwards because he's found it and stays on that website where he goes to, answer was apparently good. If the public good is part of that question or of that user profile, then it will somehow play a role. Um, if I may, and I'm sure Patrick will cover that question too, but shine, try to sh shed some different light on that, uh, on that discussion because Algorithms are one part of it, but overall, and that's why I appreciate that we talk about the news ecosystem, there are so many more factors that we have to take into account. Business models, creation of journalistic innovation, reaching new audiences, engaging with readers across the globe, and uh, I think there are, especially if you look at the actors, for example, on this panel, there are so many questions that we could answer together. And um, I definitely see many areas for collaboration, which is probably, to be frank, not how the algorithm works, because in the end, it also wouldn't be an advantage for Aftenposten or Die Zeit if they knew how the Facebook algorithm worked or the Google algorithm. So I think we need to, we should focus on areas where we can do good together. I'll come to that in a second, Google and Facebook collaboration with the news industry. Let me allow Patrick to... Yeah, um, again, I think, you know, you're raising really good questions. I think I, I, I get this asked a lot, but I think, again, it slightly, oh, the comparison between what we do and the very important work that you do and, the, and news organizations do is, is vastly different. So um, everything that is posted by friends or people you follow, everything appears in your feed, unless it goes against our community standards for whatever, you know, illegality or violence. So everything appears. This is the big difference. The algorithm helps to order it 
for the individual based on preferences and signals that we've received um, to make it meaningful, right? And that's a very big difference. Um, if, you were to, if you were to publish in your paper every single article that existed in the world, um, you'd still have to find some way to, to synthesize that. We're synthesizing that for an individual based on their preferences. So you just have to fundamentally understand you can't use, I would say, traditional media terminology and language to describe or even to criticize um, what is a fundamentally different platform. Not that we should, you know, but it's a very important debate and it, there's a lot of subtleties, but I think it's important to get to the solutions that we understand the challenge. The challenge is how do we give news organizations a more consistent voice within that space? Um, how do we also make sure that putting uh, and, and working with news organizations and, and, and working to, to improve the visibility of their brands, for example, which is a big important thing. If 50% of people, as some research says, um, say that they get news on Facebook but they're, but they're not sure of the source, then that's something we want to work together to fix. You know, how do we increase your brand visibility? How do we make sure that uh, people are aware with your logo or the coloration or something that it comes from you? Um, that's something we can fix. Um, so that's really important. And then on the question of the filter bubbles, again, it's a, it's a really important topic. Um, and we're doing a lot to address it. I think we have to also be sober about the fact of, you know, what are we comparing it to? Are we, are we comparing it to waking up in Hamburg, getting the daily paper, walking to work, talking to your friends at work, going to the pub, having a beer, and that's your entire information universe? Compared to that, what you get on Facebook, it, I would say, for most people, is much broader. Um, doesn't mean it's perfect. And so uh, there are certain ways that, however, based on your preferences, you might create a, 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 some, some themes of information um, and so one thing we're doing to address it, because it is important, is introducing things like perspectives. We're, we're testing uh, with, we tested this during the French election, where if you saw an article about Macron, you would see links to the policies of the other competing candidates, which is new, and we're testing that. Um, so we don't ignore the problem, we acknowledge that there's an issue, but I think the solutions have to be, I think, unique to the platform and done collaboratively. Thank you for that. Uh, let me move to another issue. Um, Facebook and Google, um, greatly successful companies, have now started cooperating with the news um, industry to support, to support efforts by the news industry to innovate and to be more effective. Uh, what did happen is basically, if you look at it in a cynical way, the funds that have been channeled to Facebook and Google and other platforms, but these two are at the table, um, through the advertisers or the, 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 the funds that have been lost from the news industry are coming back to fund uh, the news industry. I don't know if that that's how you see it, Guts, and how do you see this cooperation moving ahead? Well, um, as uh, I've worked in the business department of the paper for a long time, I can't really complain that a competitor um, is better in attracting um, advertising. Uh, not in general. So I would say um, uh, at long at it doesn't cost us any um, independence, we should take the money and use it. Um, I don't see whether um, uh, that's a bad thing, though um, we always have to, uh, mm, to bear in mind that, as Garrett and Patrick said, um, the news industry, so we, are only one, uh, one stakeholder in their universe. So um, we shouldn't get dependent on the, uh, the funds for innovation they provide, but um, we should uh, work together where it makes sense and actually, if some publishers uh, would have taken their earnings 10, 15 years ago to invest it into innovation, we would and not, well, have spent it for something else. We would be um, at a different point of the curve. So I'm, um, I'm not complaining, uh, but um, I would say we really have to... Um, uh, sort out well where we cooperate. Um, I don't know if you, there is anything to, you would like to add to that in terms of um, um, receiving the news <coughs> industry receiving funds from uh, from uh, Facebook or uh, like the program that Facebook and Google have developed to support the news industry and how those uh, work. If you see any problem there, conflicts of interest. Uh, if we talk business here, then uh, what we need is business models that work. I believe we create 
more value for Google and Facebook uh, than they found back. So uh, it's uh, uh, good content. Uh, it's a really important part uh, of the news feed uh, and of course of uh, Google. Uh, and I think the money that goes back to the industry, now we're talking business, uh, it's, it's, too, it's just too little. So we have to found, find uh, ways to do that, do that better. More money has to go back uh, to, uh, to the creators of uh, content. That's not an easy question, I under understand that, but I think that's a job that needs to be uh, done. And uh, until that uh, is in place, uh, I will keep and I think the title of this was the social media and um, and traditional media it's complicated in that in, in that there's a little hope uh, complicated it's not a non relationship uh, it's not a full marriage it's a little complicated uh, and uh, we have to work on that I, I if, if, uh, if you if you go to bed with an elephant and it moves, you are in trouble. So uh, I keep a little distance here. Gus, <laughs> if you want to comment on that. Um, yeah, well, I, 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 I couldn't agree more. Um, what, if we talk about the advertising business, we, we should talk. We can't do it uh, in depth today, but we should talk whether there are uh, incentives um, set by Google and Facebook that we can't compete with and that are near to well, um, unfair um, practices. I, I would say that um, there's always changing the mindset towards programmatic has um, done um, damage to uh, the publishers and beginning to do damage to television in a way that we wouldn't have seen it if Google and Facebook wouldn't have been so good in lobbying and working so well together with media agencies. So um, I don't. I think that's that's part of the truth. Though I wouldn't say I, um, we should not complain because we are bad lobbyists um, and we have well. But still, there are some some there is some there's some imbalance we can't um, uh, be happy about. Garrett, I see you wanted to. Yeah, thank you. We have, we have different jobs. One of our jobs is selling advertisements. We work together with clients and agencies, also with publishers, to deliver advertising technology. Through that, advertisements is shown to users. Um, and that is pretty successful, yes. But in many of those programs, the publisher also participates in the advertising piece, so they get the the majority of the revenue that is created through those techniques. And also, Espen, um, yes, we profit because we can show users content that is a link to a publishing product, but that link, that click goes also to you. And um, that's why there are so many teams in publishing houses who work closely together with social media and search engines to try out how they could better rank in those environments. Um, so. To, to, that is to a very large degree today a win-win situation because right now, and you come from extremely successful companies um, and you seem to be prosperity, uh, you seem to prosper also in the digital world, so. Well, we have to, yeah, that's true, but still we have to acknowledge that there are some reports out in the US and Great Britain that from every dollar or euro that just uh, is spent in programmatic only 25% just um, uh, reach the publisher. And I, I wouldn't say that 75% just stay with you. They don't. But there are some, some uh, steps in the value chain that are fostered by uh, the mindset uh, created by you uh, that programmatic is the place and, and, and the way to spend uh, money. Before, sorry, um, I'll after, like, right after Patrick, I'll uh, open to the floor. So if everybody, anybody wants to ask some questions, please. Yeah, um, I think, you know, Espen's point, I think, is, is well taken. And he's shared that with us um, before, as have many others, that the monetization needs to improve. And, you know, that's something that we would put our hand up and say, you're right. Because the three main areas where we work with partners, one is audience growth. I think we've done very well for that. 
Um, now we have partners saying, my audience has grown dramatically, but I need to make more money from it because my, my yield is lower than my own audience. Uh, and that's a good problem to have, at least, because now we're, we're working with an existing audience, but we need to move faster to, to, to give a better return. Um, and for some partners, it's working very well. And it's an article. Sometimes they get more, or they have parity, and some it's less. Um, but we make those tools available. Um, and when they say we need more, we have to measure that against the user experience that we provide, but we're definitely pedaling hard to improve it because it's critical. We have to provide more value than audience reach. Um, there are things we're doing on monetization, such as branded content opportunities that all the money goes to the partner. Some are doing it very well. Ad break is a new ad format that we're testing. We hope many will take advantage of that. Um, improving and allowing you to sell your own ads on instant articles. Again, that needs to improve. So. Um, we don't in any way think we're, 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 we're working enough in the uh, collaborate. Well, we, we need to do more in collaborative development of tools to improve monetization, which is part of the Facebook journalism project. Um, and that is actually the number one ask, in, in addition to, you know, can we support subscription models more, for example. Um, so we're doing a lot more there. But what we can't do is solve the inherent problems of a declining publishing industry that are based on models that, that are in, in many ways uh, challenged, independent of Facebook's existence. That's something I think people need to be quite sober about as well. Thank you for that. I see one question there. Yara, if you'd like. Thank you all. I'm Yara Bedr from Syria. And you are very all, <laughs> obviously, high qualified professionalism and polite. And uh, <laughs> when it's like this, I feel a lot of words I cannot understand. And let's do it in Facebook way and make it some emotion. So I will be a little <laughs> aggressive, if you allow me. I will start from the first word that about democracy. I, I, I will say I'm more afraid that we are not, in fact, going to more democracy. I would feel we are actually facing um, more isolation because, uh, especially probably Facebook, and it, it give, um, it answers this need for communicate, it's basic a human need, but also it gives you the option to communicate only with the people who are like you. And I, I would really ask how would you think that way of living by last 10 years seriously supported having more right all over the world, people just talking to each other, uh, living with each other as they are, agree with everything together, uh, no more talking, no more disagreements, no more uh, difference. Uh, just we are similarities and we are small group uh, bending to each other. So I would say, I, I would say, seriously, I am fearing for, for democracy now. I would say we had uh, seen military colonialism and then economy. And then maybe today we are going to be controlled all by one company called Facebook, with all my respect. You are doing a hard work and maybe this is the result. But that's what I'm afraid of. I would say instead of sharing information, probably we are facing misinformation. Instead of freedom, personal freedom, we are having more uh, privacy attacked from everyone. You know, guys, everything we do, where we do it, you can have a photo for ourselves in bathroom, guys, by Google Map, which is great, by the way, and I respect, and GBS, it's amazing. But from the other side, <laughs> we have issues to deal with. I would say, I, my main question will be to Facebook, not to Google. You are controlling the new generation. And how you look to yourself as a message. Do, do, for me, I feel you are helping to publish so much entertainment. And that's not what media and the press do. Press work for education. Uh, this is space between entertainment and education, it's a big question because what we saw in Facebook, which is great multi-optional tool, especially for Syria, it was fantastic, but still there was a lot of no information, but a lot of feelings, personal, personal issues. And for Google, <clears throat> I would say about Google and Facebook, I would say one question about the content. Like for example, first point for Google, um, when I want to open an account on Gmail, I have the agreement on English. And you know, in Arabic word, for example, few people know English. Maybe this is not your fault, but just from 
kind of respect if they can read it in Arabic. Even though they don't have the option to say, no, I don't agree. It's just one agree. But still, if they can read it in Arabic, that will be very respectable for millions of people who read in Arabic. Okay. Last question to Facebook. When you decided to take the uh, photo of Van Kim Vogue from Vietnam, 1972, in September 2016 from Facebook because she was naked, what, what kind of mythology you, you do to control content? Because I think this photo, it's international press heritage and it should be out of reach for anyone. It's for, for the new generation and I don't think it, it humanate anyone. Thank to see it because this was fact and it changed history. Um, thank you for that. Thank Maybe you. if I can take one more question before giving the floor back to you. If I sure. Hello, I'm Edward Lucas and The Economist and a columnist for The Times of London. Um, if you click on a link and it's going to take you to a website that will infect your computer, Google provides a very handy red screen it used to say, yes, I know what I'm doing, but they discovered that most men confronted with that button click on it. And so you've now redesigned it, and it says um, that it deter it's very successful, deters you from going to these um, websites, also to phishing websites. My question is whether um, you and Facebook and the other platforms shouldn't be doing more on this um, in terms of advising, giving people more clarity about what they're clicking on, because at first sight, all new sites look pretty similar, whether it's a completely bogus one like USA Politics Today, which is designed to look like USA Today, or whether it's the real thing. You have, with your algorithms, the ability to see, does this website have a street address? Does it have a phone number? Does it print corrections and clarifications? Does it have real people working on it? All the things that are indicative of real news. These are things that it's quite hard for individuals to, to, to find out on a regular basis. It's just time consuming. Why don't you give us better signposts about what we're clicking on? That's, that's a really good question. In fact, um, we've done a lot of work on that. That's something that came up at the end of last year after the US election. It's part of our Facebook journalism project and the News Integrity Initiative. A couple things we're doing, because it's, it's super important, is technologically, with our algorithms um, and artificial intelligence, we can, I, we can look and find uh, whether there's any sort of history with this publication, um, whether it has a history of, of, of people going and, 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 and rejecting that very quickly. And so those things get deprecated. In many cases, we find that they're against our ad policies and they get removed altogether. Um, the worst of the worst comes down. Um, we're also finding ways where we don't want to use these tools of, say, a history to um, make an independent journalist who started their own page have, have, a, have less of a voice, so we have to be careful not to, to hammer out uh, the independent voices that don't have a history that might look like something that's meant to deceive. Um, and so that's why we're also looking to, to create different ways in which we can have signposts, we have verification ch ch checks and so forth. So there's a lot of work going into it. It's, it's really important and it's important that we get it right. Um, but it's a game of kind of whack-a-mole. You know, we have to try and fix one thing and somebody pops up somewhere else. If you're interested, we, we, po we published a, a white paper called The Information Operations. Um, about how people are trying to use these platforms to deceive, and it's, it's quite informative and interesting. I think April 27th, it was published, Information Operations. Um, some great information there, um, but a lot of hard work's going into it because it's important. Um, very briefly on the terror of war, and I'm going to like speed round. Um, that was something where we had made a mistake. We didn't make a mistake removing the, a photo of a, of a naked child. That goes down anywhere, and I can appreciate, you can, I'm sure, appreciate why. Um, but when it, we were informed, and Espen was correct to call us out on this, um, as was the culture and, and the, prime, the prime minister, um, there was a newsworthy exception there. There was, a, there was an exception based on newsworthiness that they had identified and the context was correct. And so we made an exception. And since then, we've actually changed our policy. So they were correct. We made a mistake. We've changed our policy. And now we have teams that will look at something that, um, first of all, we know who the partners are and we can have a phone call if, if we see something come up. Second of all, our teams are better trained. Third of all, we have more teams in place. You saw now we've added 3,000 more content operations people to our hiring roster. Um, but we want to get it right. And when we make a mistake, we're not afraid to say why uh, or, or, or change our policies. I think the third one, I, I, I don't know if I agree with you or if necessarily other people would agree with you that Facebook is only a place for entertainment and, and lightheartedness. Um, in fact, uh, you know, even just looking at the partners that I have spent time with and that I travel around to see, whether that be with Al Quds Network in, in, in the West Bank, who have millions of followers on Facebook, and that is their means of communicating uh, with their fan base, to Channel 4 News, 
which has gone from 5 million views on video uh, per, uh, per month to over a quarter of a billion views per month on Facebook. And this is good, solid journalism. This includes a, a video of, a, of somebody in Syria that was produced in Syria that had 60 million views. So the same technology that I think people fear and, and question and, and feel some angst about is the, is the technology that allows information to spread globally, instantaneously, and to solve really big problems. So we have to make sure, as Mark said in his 5,700 word manifesto, which I'm sure you've all read, um, we have to make sure that we focus on the things that are good, but we mitigate the things that are bad. We also recognize that just making people more connected isn't necessarily a net positive, and that's a big learning for us, and we have to do better. Um, but we hear you. Garrett, if you would like to. Th thank you very much for um, making this call to action for uh, technology to play a more active role for, for democ democracy or the, the freedom of the press. Um, it totally r resonates with me. Um, as, so my company doesn't have, have all the answers there, right? Uh, so what, how we could do more to, to, to support uh, freedom of speech and, and democracy worldwide. Um, that's, to be honest, also part of the reason why we created this digital news initiative, where we try to support people, for example, with a fund of 150 million euro, <clears throat> to come up with their own ideas, how that could work. How journalism, technology, and really new ideas could come together. And uh, we are happy there that we have the, the means to, to support people who have more creative ideas. And another pillar of that, what we do there is we trained in the last years, uh, two years 30,000 uh, journalists in Europe so that they can do a better job with technological tools. And um, those, we, we do those things because we believe in the value and because we see the need. And um, please allow me to repeat myself. If I think in the ecosystem we all play different roles and we should come together and, and do that in an orchestrated way. Thank you for that, Daoud. Um, I've been a Twitter user for a long time, but as you said, Palestinians and others uh, are huge on Facebook, and I've had to double up. I do my stuff in English on Twitter and stuff in Arabic on Facebook to get to, uh, to the people who follow me. Uh, I have a few questions. One of them is the 5,000 rule. Why is there a rule of no more than 5,000 friends, unless you turn to a page or something like that, which has its own problems for me. Uh, secondly, I, I run a small community radio, and we do very well on Facebook. We have huge engagements daily, but there is no monetization for us. I mean, we, we would like to have, as was suggested, some kind of a, a return, at least to, uh, to help us as a, as a small independent organization to survive in this very, very bad economic situation. Um, I'm not sure about the 5,000 rule. I think we want to make sure that people are differentiating between a public figure or a, an organization and, and, and a private individual. And that's why uh, we, we, we try and make that distinction. I think sometimes um, we've also had instances where, where private people have get, grown so many friends that um, you know, they, they are actually public figures that are still trying to act like a, a private person. So I don't know exactly the detail behind it, but, it, but it's good you raise it. Then the monetization point, we talked about this a little bit. Um, there are tools available to you. Uh, branded content tools are, I think, the most robust for, for small organizations. There are lots of organizations like Onid, what's it pronounced? Onideo in, in Turkey. Uh, they are like the BuzzFeed for Turkey, and they are uh, or, or like the Unilad in the UK. Um, Channel 4 News, again, they're using our, content, our branded content tools to go and seek sponsorship have that brand represented visibly with a click through to the brand and the data is shared with the brand on Facebook. So these are ways that you can do it. In terms of ad formats, we're building them. Um, su su support for subscriptions, you can do that through the call to action in instant articles. Um, can we do better? Yeah, we can do better. I think one of the challenges for small news organizations or local news is that you need a lot of scale for advertising and you also need a lot of traffic to convert for subscription. And so this is one area where we've noticed um, I think a need for to, to come up with more creative models, and that's one of the focus areas of our Facebook journalism project is small local news operations that previously in many ways relied on classifieds, for example, um, but the journalism is suffering because a lot of the economic models have been turned upside down. Thank you. I, maybe I, I have a final question to all the panelists. Uh, um, Google and Facebook have been greatly successful, and today they have a de facto monopoly in their spheres of 
business uh, uh, to the point that some observers have come to call for uh, antitrust regulation to break up this monopoly to ensure diversity, something that the media industry has been under. Um, in acknowledgement also of the role that companies like Google and Facebook do play in the public sphere. May I have your comments on that? Uh, well, uh, two things. First of all, um, um, that we are talking is a good is a good sign. We didn't ha really have a relationship. Now we have one, and that makes doesn't make things always easier. But um, uh, it will take us somewhere. Um, as um, you mentioned, uh, the de facto monopoly in your fields in social and search. Um, has turned you in something like an infrastructure company. And we have experiences in how to, well, regulate and correspond as societies and, and states with infra infrastructure companies. So I believe that um, there should be somehow an institution in Europe uh, that builds up um, intelligence and experience in um, uh, well social and search and acts as a regulator so both sides society states and companies do not have to wait for example four or six years between a conflict and a solution uh, this time it was a fine of 110 million but there's no that's not a working uh, relationship if uh, if you have six years in a, in a landscape that is moving so fast. I don't think that uh, regulation always has to be much harder. In some ways, yes, in others, no. But we have to get into a different landscape in terms of that, I believe. Gary, do we need new rules? No. We, are, we are working together with Every institution, be it the Cartel office in Bonn, be it the European Commission, uh, we discuss new rules, we discuss our role, uh, we are completely open and share the information that are asked from us. Um, I have to contradict, nevertheless, uh, this term of monopoly. We are in an extremely competitive environment here for advertising, for reach, for attention. So yes, we have market positions that are not too small, I agree. Nevertheless, if someone looks for to, to buy a hair dryer, he searches for that on Amazon. If he looks for, for his friend's posts, she goes to, to, to Facebook. If that person looks for, for a news article, she might end up on Twitter or Google. So, and this is only the international level. You have all the local players. So it's such a rich environment out there. And um, definitely, we play our role. We answer the questions. Nevertheless, I see lots of competition everywhere. Edmund, you have called for new standards. Uh, do, you, do we need new rules as well? I, I think it was interesting yesterday that the EU Commission f uh, fined uh, Facebook for not coming forward with uh, information that data between WhatsApp and Facebook could, could be, uh, could be uh, merged. I think in the future there will be discussions like should really Facebook be able to also own WhatsApp, Instagram, Messenger, which are all four uh, among uh, the ten biggest mediums uh, in, in, in the world uh, in amount of, of, uh, of uh, users. That's sort of one kind of uh, more traditional discussion. However, I, I, I don't think uh, you said it was in effect a monopoly. It's, it's, I think you cannot use existing uh, language and uh, regulatory uh, for defining what is a monopoly on businesses like Google and uh, Facebook. So uh, if we are in a standard oil situation, it is also very different from what it was. So. Uh, they, they broke up Standard Oil uh, or US, but they will not break up uh, Facebook. So, just give you an example of this new kind of power that we have never, never seen before, uh, which I call lo uh, the power to launch uh, self-driving cars, 
uh, if Facebook decided to do banking tomorrow, could be rolled out in the whole of the world. We could transmit money, uh, and and I think the logic uh, of that would be that uh, a lot of the banking industry would be wiped out uh, very uh, fast. It's just two very very small examples of what kind of power you get when you have close to 2 billion users with a daily use in a feed and you can use that data, build artificial, artificial intelligence and also roll out on the platform. We don't have language for that uh, and, uh, and uh, I think that will be a discussion in the years to come. How do we ha handle that? Is it, is it a good thing? Probably not. So what do we do? Thank you. If I may change the question for you, it's exactly focus on data. Uh, we are all worried about Facebook collecting so much data about us and Google as well, certainly. But um, and uh, which guarantees can we have that, or what 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 is the philosophy that Facebook is developing in order to deal with these amounts of data and yet protect the users? Um, I mean, we actually have published a lot of information on our uh, privacy guidelines. Um, that's something that we are extremely buttoned up about. We take very seriously. I'm glad that we resolved the, um, the misunderstanding in, in Europe with, with regarding WhatsApp. And we'll take responsibility um, where we find that there's a fault, but that is something that we, we protect. In fact, many of our partners, media partners, news partners, are asking us for, can we get more of this data? Can we get more of this data? And so it's an important theme for us. How do we share <clears throat> relevant information and signals through our tools, but also protect privacy? We will always err on the side of the individual. Um, because they entrust us with that information. So th that's non-negotiable for us, and I recommend you, you read about our policies. Um, with regard to the, the bigger picture, I mean, we focus a lot on collaboration. We're, we're much more transparent than, we, than we've ever been, I think, and that's important. Um, we're much more engaged. We have more people in the field, and we're listening better. Our products are evolving in, 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 in collaboration with partners, and that's, I think, critical. Uh, the other thing is we can actually move as an industry together faster in many cases than, than, than governments or different bodies. So a good example of that is you know, following the hate speech code of conduct you know, and, and working together with Google and Twitter to create this hash database for um, content that is harmful to children and others, that if we find something in our system, we put that into a central database that is then shared and before it even appears on Twitter or, or, or Google, it, 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 it's, it's dead in the water. So we can develop technologies together through open collaboration and I think that's a, a better route and we're very much focused on that. Thank you very much for that. Are you willing to work with the IPI to address the issue of attacks against journalists on social media? We're happy to, to discuss that as well. You guys should join our News Integrity Initiative as well. Absolutely. Thank you so much for the, to the panelists. They will still be around, and I encourage all of you to uh, ask more questions and engage in conversation. I'm so happy that you all came here. It was a wonderful conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.